Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Today, we're joined by Danny Kloon, who is uh, running or is the Revenue Operations Manager and New Seller. Danny, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks for having me, guys. And so I'm seeing, or I'm sensing a, a history of uh, actually being in the sales function before you transitioned into ops, or actually maybe you did that throughout your journey. So I'd love to understand um, why you have made the decision, I guess, to come in and be ops like more like as a, as a full-time career almost. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I went to college at uh, Northeastern University in Boston, where a big part of going there is their, their co-op program. So as a part of your learning, instead of doing five, the standard five year, four years, you do five years and you do intern internships throughout. So I did three internships, all of which were in sales. So ranging from cold calling, um, literally going to an office park and knocking on doors, selling telecom solutions, and then even convenience store sales. So like order fulfillment, that was also all on the road. Um, Wildly interesting. I would recommend cold calling to literally anybody in any profession, um, especially with an end in sight. Doing the internship was nice because it was like, all right, I just have to do this for six months and then I can be done with it. Um, it's very difficult to do, uh, but great lessons learned. I, I, you know, folks go to this school and they say, I want to do an internship to lose to learn what I want to do. I went and learned what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to sell. But I also learned that I loved salespeople. Um, they come from all walks of life, all backgrounds. It's something you don't need a degree for, and you can be excellent at it and be one of the top earning reps. And I really liked working with all those different folks. I just knew I didn't want to sell. Um, so first job out of college, I was getting a lot of sales-based interviews um, and, and kind of turning them down until I found sales ops. And that was my first introduction to to it. So did you simply see, say, an opening or you uh, you were in an interview for a sales role and they were like, no, actually, we think you should look at this sales ops role? Yeah. So I actually, I saw the opening. So I was, like I said, there were just so many sales jobs available and I was kind of trying to avoid it because I knew what it was going to be. And I, I, I studied marketing at school. So that's kind of what I was looking at. Um, and then, yeah, I just, I saw the sales ops coordinator role that ended up being my first job, took the interview and I was like, okay, this is, this is the balance I'm looking for. So is that a front stream? Yes, exactly. Awesome. But then I'm also seeing here, and I'm just taking this from LinkedIn, right? That you also at front stream were an account manager. So I assume you were selling as well. Yeah. So, uh, the sales ops role kind of ran its course while I was there where, I was just kind of stuck in a rut doing the same sort of, we were doing lead gen, we had the same email marketing we were kind of doing once a month. And it was just not as, it just wasn't very stimulating. Um, so an account manager role opened up and I was like, okay, uh, you know, a little more pay. It's something I've done in the past and I've enjoyed it. They gave me the opportunity for some process improvement, which is kind of, you know, I like the problem solving aspect. So um, made the switch and very soon remembered why I got out of selling in the first place and didn't want to be in it. Um, it, it just, it wasn't very busy, which was, was you know, I always like to be busy. Um, I, I even re wrote a Salesforce handbook for account management while I was in that role because I was just like, I need something to do. So I wrote like this 25 page manual. Um, and that's when I was kind of like, okay, uh, that was a nice little test to get back into it. I think I was only in it for like six or seven months. Um, and at that point I was, my life was taking me to New York city. So it was kind of the perfect time to explore getting back into sales ops. Got it. And so to zoom in now on new seller, roughly how many reps, uh, well, sales and CS are you supporting and roughly how many people in the rev ops function? Oof. There's about... 150 in the customer, we call it like the customer org. So it's like you said, the account managers, the CSMs, and then field SDRs. And on the RevOps team, we have 
um, our director of RevOps, myself, uh, comp, and then a sales support team of three. So there's, uh, there's six of us. Yep. Awesome. And what would you say the right now is your biggest challenge? It's a good question. Um, we're, we're, we're working on standing up a deal desk right now where we have a, a twice weekly meeting, um, but with 150 sellers and managers, it is just too difficult to stay ahead of these deals, especially because right now we're in that, that uh, timeline in a company where we're scaling to enterprise sales, right? So deals are getting more complex, they're larger, there's more value, there's way more legal back and forth. Um, so we like the point of deal desk is to get ahead of these and have a rep or manager bring them to us so we can review them first, get legal involved, get finance involved, get accounting and billing involved. And it is just, it, it's too hard to stay ahead of. I mean, we, we, we had one just yesterday where, you know, it's the end of the quarter. We just received the the contract at the end of last week and we're trying to get legal on board. We're trying to get sales support on board. And, and you know, we're getting the push like this should get turned around quicker, but there's also this deal over here going on that we're trying to support. So it's just really trying to stay ahead of it all and set those policies and guidelines so that we don't have to have these issues come up with two days left in the quarter. Yeah, so is the solution policies and guidelines or is the solution just more resources here? So that's Both. that's why this is such a challenge right now is that's what we're trying to decide. There's definitely a training and enablement side to it, like reps understanding this is what we can and can't do. Um, but then there is the pure resource side of it. We need, is it that we need more heads on sales support? Is that, you know, account managers need somebody dedicated all the time? It, are we responsible for that resource or should it be their team that has to, to get somebody on board? Um, so that's literally, that's what we're talking about all day, every day right now. It sounds stressful, but it still it also sounds like a, quite a good problem to have. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about some of the largest deals our company has seen. You know, these are champagne problems when we're going back and forth on and redlining contracts. <laughs> exactly. And then looking forward to say like 12 to 18 months, this deal desk thing is set up running smoothly. What is the one like strategic initiative or improvement that you would like to implement? Yeah. Um, so something that we're working on right now that I've been kind of pulling data for and having a difficult time with is really sort of uh, a, a overarching product analysis. So I don't know if you saw my LinkedIn. I, I actually was at Newzella for a couple of years from 2017 to 2019, left for two years for another startup and just came back. Um, and the product suite has, has changed a bit, but there's still a lot uh, that is a bit dated that we're starting to kind of move away from. Um, so, I mean, you said 12 to 18 months, but the conversations are happening now where it's, what are the right products to be selling? What are the right prices to be selling them at? Like this full-blown analysis hasn't really happened where as we sort of scale for growth, we kind of need to reassess all of those things. Like we've typically done a lot of comps and pilots. Should we be doing those anymore? Are we at a point as a business where we don't have to do that? And our, our product kind of speaks for itself. So uh, like, like I said, you, those conversations are starting now. But as you guys probably know, those are lengthy conversations and they do involve product. They involve marketing. So um, they're not going to be quick, quick wins for sure. But it's definitely somewhere where you kind of look at some of these deals and it's like, why are we, it feels like we're giving things away or we're not giving them the right product. So that's something I'm really excited to sink my teeth in now that I'm back. Yeah, it sounds like a very, um, you know, you have the matrix of urgency versus important. And so it sounds like a low urgent, but very important task that is going to be great to, to get done. Exactly. On that note, Alex, can we bring you in to dive a little bit deeper? Can I do? Thanks, Tom. Um, thanks, Danny. Um, yeah, some really interesting pieces there. Just I think two things. 
um, you just said last, I think, but you were sort of diving into. Um, the first is sort of the deal desk function that you you know you, you've been setting up. Um, again, lots of you know people you know wishing to again to get your champagne problems and scale to a point where they're going to need that. But but could you could you speak a bit to how how you sort of change how you decided on wanting to run a, a deal desk function and and how you've put it together? Yeah, so it's something that we were discussing before I left the first time a couple of years back. Uh, where we just knew that every contract that's of a certain threshold needs eyes. Um, every sort of special billing terms need, need eyes. Like these things need to be flagged. So uh, when I when I came back a, a few months ago, that was my number one responsibility was getting that stood up. Um, the the conversation that I had with our director of RevOps was okay. There's the right like pie in the sky way to do this but then there's the what are the quick wins we can get in between so we started with the quick wins where it was okay let's get a meeting with all the stakeholders on the books twice a week get that stood up and then we can kind of just send an email to the sales managers and say hey we have this going on here's the types of deals we want to see and if you can start sending us those ad hoc and we'll get you scheduled on the deal desk and get you in there and start to get into a flow um, then the 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 beast is the the policy and guidelines. It's like I think we're at eighteen pages now that doc is. Um, but it's what will we allow? What is our threshold for allowing it? What is like absolutely not? We won't do this. And that's anything from legal billing terms, um, multi year contracts, the gamut of everything that makes up each contract. Um, so that was kind of the lengthy piece of putting together because we also needed ELT buy-in, we needed finance buy-in, we needed buy-in from all of those different groups. Um, next is how are we going to get these items reported to us? So Slack is great, but it, there's no tracking or anything. It's all just kind of existing in a silo. So something that we're rolling out at the beginning of October is a super simple form baked into our opportunity page layout that's literally just here's the guidelines for deal desk. If this deal meets it, go ahead and submit this. It's two questions. It is what is the ask from the customer and what is the value of the customer? They submit that, it automatically submits a case to our deal desk queue. And then we'll get them on the schedule, track everything through that case record, and then close it out once it's complete. The last phase to this will be actually building those controls into Salesforce. So having a flag that says this doesn't meet our terms, automatically submit it to deal desk or submit this contracting language and this doesn't fit the terms, automatically submit. So having the approval workflows, the validation rules, the really kind of meaty pieces stood up in Salesforce to make it so we don't need to rely on reps to tell us that something needs to go to deal desk, it'll happen automatically. Amazing. Thanks. That was super helpful and, and clear kind of explanation. And I think um, for you know, our audience who have run lots of projects in their time of all different sorts, you know, the, the other thing is the general principle of, you know, what's the quick wins? Um, let's architect out the ideal and then start with the quick wins towards that. So we're moving in the direction of, of utopia, but but we're moving as quickly and rapidly as we can. So I think that's super super helpful, and um, yeah, I think just great great insight to, to how to do that there. So then, the, really, the next piece just to, to talk about further is you mentioned that, that you know your your challenge now is around the product and working out you know what should your your pricing and and um, sort of you know, market offerings be going forward. And and again, just fun, fascinating to hear how you, how you can approach that. Um, what what some of the key things you're expecting to look at? How you're gonna you know make sure you've got all the stakeholders and work out from everyone's point of view what what the way ahead is. And then yeah, so if you can just share some insight onto to that process, that'd be great. Yeah, so kind of the way I've looked at it so far is it sounds really basic, but just what are we selling? Looking at the last year, what is being sold um, at high values and, and and high record counts? So. Um, and who is it being sold to? Are they the customers that we want to be selling that product to? Are we the cust- Are they the customers we want to continue to work towards selling to and put resources towards? Um, 
And then what are we renewing as well? Because there are products that we have tried to uh, kind of get rid of and but folks keep renewing them every year and okay, will you upgrade to this next week? No, this is really all we need. So that, that's that been a little bit of a struggle. And I think at some point we're going to need to take a hard line. And so that's where the actual value will come into play. So there's the, what are we selling? And then how much are we actually getting out of it? Um, like, what is the cost of selling that product? Is it worth that to have that? Um, and so that's been the next piece of it is, are we renewing these at high values? Is it worth it to keep? Are, are these deal breakers for these customers? We have large enterprise customers that are using a, a product we've tried to sunset over a year ago. Um, and it's probably not, it's it's worth that relationship. So in the early stages, that's that's really what I've kind of done the initial sort of, of look at. And then there's the piece around what products are we selling separately that that don't need to go separately and should just really be bundled into these other products. So there's there's the next level of bundling and how we sell it and how we market it. Um, that will be kind of a, a 2022 analysis. Oh, thanks. No, again, really, really helpful. And yeah, that, I think we can have, feel that pressure to build out a, you know, a, a lavish sort of product offering of you know lots of different things, and and, and it seems like a great way to monetize. But actually. You know, simplicity, and as you said, some bundling things back together, working out what's what's no longer commercially viable, or, or when you can make that call, we'll say, uh, this isn't this isn't available anymore. Right. Um, yeah, really interesting. Um, yeah, insights there. So one last question for me, and really, it's just to to throw the floor over to you, which is um, so it's a very sort of open ended question. But you know, anything, any sort of insights that you've got about um, kind of the future of of RevOps or or something you stood, or maybe um, a best practice that you such so good anymore, or something that people should be doing that they're not. You know, anything in that kind of realm of any any kind of goals that you've kind of been thinking about recently. That yeah, um, it's a good question. I think uh, the biggest thing for me, especially coming from a sales ops background and moving over to RevOps is definitely to consider to continue to think about the customer from the beginning to the end of their life cycle and uh, not kind of losing sight of each step in that process. Because I found being in sales ops, I was very much, let's get them in the door, let's get a contract and let's move on to the next thing. Um, now moving over to RevOps, I'm looking so much more at what are they renewing? What what what's the value of these customers over time? Like looking at that that LTV as opposed to just you know I was in such a CAC world before and now I've moved to to looking at lifetime value so much more. Um, I think something I've learned is is and this would be like what I would say is don't be afraid to to dive into the data and kind of roll up your sleeves and spend a day or two in spreadsheets or Looker or Tablet, whatever it is you're using, and really take the time to learn those tools. Because I found in other roles that data teams are some of the busiest teams at companies. They're getting requests from every single department. Being able to, to know how to use Looker or whatever your data viz tool is can save you so much time when looking at these sort of lifetime value sort of metrics because you're no longer looking at just Salesforce data. You're looking at your product data, you're looking at marketing data, and, and those types of tools are what can bring that all together. So, you know, doing things like taking a SQL course or just taking a looker course or something like that. So that, you know, the data team is great and they'll give you great insights and they have a place. So don't get me wrong. It's just you can save yourself time and, and draw your own conclusions by, by kind of learning that sort of stuff and, and being able to pick it up and uh, kind of do your own analysis. Oh, brilliant. Thanks. Very helpful. And yeah, I think, I think good, good sort of career progression tip. And yeah, just the value of not being dependent on, as you said, one of the more overworked functions in the business um, gives you a chance to scale your, your, your team much quicker as well. Right. right thanks so much, Tom. You're going to come back and, and wrap up for us. Yeah.
Danny, the most important question of the interview, who in the world of revenue ops would you most like to take for lunch? I knew this question was coming because I've uh, listened to the podcast before. Um, there's definitely a couple folks. Uh, both of them, I'm just a total LinkedIn creeper on. Um, so they're not folks I know personally at all. But um, one of them is David Giller. He's a Salesforce consultant. Uh, I think he was formerly like an attorney, which is I, something else I love about sales and RevOps. Folks just pick it up, like learn about it and just kind of fall in love with Salesforce or something. And he's totally one of those folks. Total Salesforce nerd. Um, tons of good tips. I would love to be able to pick his brain. I know there's so many things I do in the system that I'm wasting time or resources doing that. Uh, you know, he just he just has that sort of knowledge and like how to set it up, how to set up the perfect instance. Um, so that would definitely be one of them. And then Rob Levy, he's the VP of RevOps at Monotype. He's another guy that just posts really interesting content. Um, I don't know about you guys, but LinkedIn has just so much fluff and nonsense on it these days. It's becoming like the new Facebook. Um, but he posts like really poignant content. Um, he's worked internationally. So he has a really interest, interesting um, point of view on a lot of different things. Uh, and he's, he's another guy that came from just a weird background and found and fell in love with Rev and Sales Ops. So those would be the two guys for sure. Awesome. Shout out to both. Now, Danny, I want to thank you for coming on and sharing kind of some details that I think are going to be relevant for other companies who, who are growing or maybe moving into the enterprise level. Specifically, I enjoyed the more strategic project that you think is going to be important in the next 12 to 18 months, which is the whole review of uh, the product strategy. So I want to thank you for coming on and being so honest and open about your, what you're currently working on. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. This was great. Thanks for having me, guys.